Okay. Uh, so this is going to be, you know, the other the other part of the Elastic family, which is the observability stack, and and using not just Elasticsearch but all of the other parts. This will be kind of the, my personal journey over the last year. So let's start with the introductions. Hi, my name is Honza. I'm a I'm a local here from Prague, and I've joined Elastic about 11, 11 years ago, uh, similar similar to Karel, and then I left a couple of years ago, and I joined a company last year to that tasked me to kind of revamp their their infrastructure, and part of that was of course the observability stack. So this will be kind of my this this talk will be my therapy, because like I've I've implemented observability based on Elastic many times before. Uh, select notifications, always fun. Um, and this uh, this time it was actually me running it and not just doing it on behalf of of uh, some Elastic client because that was my role previously as a consultant at Elastic. So what was the use case? So the use case was a was a company it was a machine learning company AI based, and they had uh, they were based on cloud. They're doing a lot of Kubernetes works, uh, a lot of background tasks as you can imagine for kind of any ML AI based operations. So a lot of tasks, a lot of aggressive auto scaling up and back. Uh, so at the peak of uh, processing at 2 a.m. in the morning, we would have thousands and thousands of, of pods, hundreds of Kubernetes nodes, and we wanted to monitor it all. So this is the journey of how everything, how everything went. It's divided into three parts. The first part is very short, it's called the good. So let's talk about like what went, what went well. So the first part that went well is admittedly the most important one. Like we managed to do it and we managed to, set, uh, to fulfill the goals that we set up for ourselves. We were able to control the costs. We were able to bring the overall costs down and we were able to implement kind of a single version of truth for all of our observable data and have it adopted by the entire team. Previously, observably was solved by a combination of kind of the GCP native uh, resources so Google Cloud Logging and uh, some outside services like Honeycomb and, and other things. So that was not ideal where we were split, in, split into two different parts. So when we managed to put it all into one kind of giant bucket, and as we saw in the previous talk, it's a kind of smart bucket, it, it worked really well and it allowed us to do some, some interesting things. So that went really well. The other things that went well was that all of the technologies that we use, Kubernetes and GCP, were kind of supported out of the box. But the box kind of was damaged in shipping. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so, the, uh, so the easy part was the deployment. I can, I can set up Elasticsearch in my sleep, but I don't, want to, I don't want to run it. I don't want to carry a pager. So Elastic Cloud, it worked fine for, for our use case. And that was really, that was really a no-brainer. Uh, so kudos to the uh, Elastic Cloud team. It gets worse. The other part that, that worked was the Elastic agent. So that's the agent that sits on, on your edge nodes and collects all the data and ships them to the central location, which for our case was the Elastic Cloud. There are some good things and some bad things. The good things was, again, that it has all of these different things. It, it supports the technologies. It understands what GCP is and what are the different parts that you need to, or that you want to monitor. The same for Kubernetes or for Postgres or, uh, or, uh, or, something, or something similar. So that worked really well. What also worked really well is it was just one, uh, one piece that we had to install. More to that later, because it's not really that much true anymore. So that kind of worked. Um, and what we what also worked, again with a caveat, was we used Terraform to orchestrate it all. We chose Terraform because we we had that all throughout the company to kind of orchestrate and uh, and provision all of our resources, primarily of course the cloud ones, and we wanted the observability to be baked in. We never wanted that to be an afterthought. So if somebody asked for a cluster to be provisioned, it came with a pretty fine set of observability tools. Uh, the, the data collection, but also the, the alerts and the dashboards 
that, that had to come with it. So Terraform, the tool that was creating the cluster, was the obvious choice to make this work as well. And that worked most of the time, but there were some, some exceptions. The one exception was um, Elastic finally decided to you know, invest some time into the Terraform provider, so they created a new version. That was great. That solved a lot of our issues that we were having. The only slight issue is you know, there was no migration path. You, we kind of had to throw away everything that we did until then and start over with a new provider for absolutely no good reason. So that's going to be you know, the theme of the rest of the presentation. I was hoping that there's going to be a lot more people from Elastic because this is kind of what, what it was aimed at. Uh, but yeah, it works mostly. So Terraform, the, the only part that didn't work was migrating from one part to another. We were kind of left behind as users. We migrated to the new version. We imported everything manually. It was an afternoon of fun activity, but then, then it was great. So what actually went well was uh, the integration to the rest of the company. So people kind of saw the appeal of having everything in one place, of having it integrated from logging to metrics to APM uh, and, and some, uh, some custom data as well. And they make use of it immediately, kind of even like above and beyond my expectations. Uh, by week two of having some APM data in Elastic, uh, they were already kind of integrating it with, with, with their deployment where uh, there was a there was a uh, rollout of a new version over the Kubernetes, and it was querying APM. And if there were significantly more errors appearing, it would roll back the deployment. That's that's pretty cool. So that's why I mean, like overall, it worked. It achieved the goal. But that's where this chapter ends, and we're going over to the second chapter of this talk. So, as I mentioned. Elastic Agent is only the one thing that we, that we had to deploy. And we were having kind of a standardized, standardized environment, right? GCP, Kubernetes, pretty standard stuff. I was actually even, even super enthused that I found a blog post that detailed exactly everything what we, what we wanted to do in a single blog post. <clears throat> so this is a screenshot of that blog post. <laughs> so you can see that something for a standardized environment, this is the entire length of the blog post. And granted, there are some explanations there that like, are not part of the deployment itself. But kind of the telling part of this blog post is it uses some custom cloned Helm charts. It downloads a, a, a YAML file from somewhere on, on Elastic GitHub and then patches it with a patch file just to make that work. And this is from official kind of Elastic blog post. This is how you're supposed to deploy Elastic Agent and the observability suit on Kubernetes on Google Cloud. Like, really? Like, that was, that was kind of a sad moment of realization of, you know, what are the, the glories that await us? Because the Helm charts that would, that would make some of that, uh, some of that easier were deprecated. So they're no longer supported. So literally all we had to do is download a YAML file that had a few thousand lines, modify some of them uh, somewhere, and then you know, uh, learn from support a few months later that there was, a, there was a bug in those YAML files. And you also had to modify all of these things, which you now have to find in a 2,000 line YAML file that you've already modified. That was fun. Uh, so, but we, we managed. We managed to deploy. A, a standalone, a standalone Elastic Agent that collected all of the data that we that we needed, and uh, we moved on. The first part is like, why did we even move uh, use the standalone uh, standalone Elastic Agent as opposed to the fleet, the feature of of the the Elastic Stack where you can just you know click centrally once, what integrations you want, and it will deploy to all of the agents. Well, several reasons. First, it wasn't available in Terraform, despite it being a few, few years already out in GA. Second, it is not documented. The APIs for fleet UIs are documented. This is a screenshot from the official Terraform provider for Elasticsack, which tells you, look into the UI about how it works. 
And that's another theme that we'll see repeated during this talk, where the parts in the documentation is just the UI, if that. So that's where uh, Fleet wasn't the, the, such, a, such a good, such a good you know, case for us. The other part, uh, the other issue was, uh, if you have a, 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 an environment that aggressively scales up and down, Fleet doesn't really keep up performance-wise because you suddenly have a thousand new agents and then they go away and neither the Fleet server nor the agents themselves are fully equipped to deal with that in a seamless fashion. So, but that said, we managed to deploy our Elastic agents and it mostly worked. We're mostly relying on, on the other things. We were able to copy paste uh, some YAMLs from the UI as, as we were advised uh, into the configuration files and moving on. So the next part that we dealt with were the integrations. So this is the actual screenshot of our uh, built-in dashboard for uh, Kubernetes pods. And we have some, some, some great value here uh, where we have several hundreds of pods out of roughly 10,000. And who here can see what's going on here? So that kind of brings us to, to, the, uh, to the other part about, about the Elastic Stack. It's great, you have all of the data in one place. Unfortunately, what's missing is some guidance and some insight into, into the data. Because what you have, even in specialized pages, so this is a, this is a dashboard, but you even have an app in Kibana that, that provides you a kind of a deep dive into just one pod for, uh, uh, in, your, in your Kubernetes clusters. And you have some metrics, you have CPU, memory, and network, and that's it. Net memory usage is in percentage. Who, who here knows, especially from the Elastic folk, percentage of what? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and also, this is I particularly chose a pod that runs the Elastic Agent. So there is there is a there is a well documented and well known process that's running in this pod. Despite of that, I still just have my three metrics: CPU usage, again in percentage of what I have no idea, uh, and I have I have my memory and some network traffic. So the network traffic is the only actual number that I get out of this uh, out of this page, uh, but still, for something that's that's built in, I would kind of expect more. So that's that's that was a little a little disappointing, especially when it comes to something like Elastic Stack, where there is a lot of information attached to it. Uh, it's the 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 promise is that you you control the entire kind of uh, flow of the data from the generation in the Elastic Agent all the way to the visualization, uh, yet you still really don't get the information about what memory usage means or what CPU usage means. And I'm not even getting into the differences between you know, pod versus node versus container, which is indexed as three different, three different fields for some reason. So if I wanna see how much CPU is being used, I need to have kind of a glorified if statement in my code, which is, am I dealing with the container? or with a, with a pod or with a node. And I get three different numbers in three different fields. Not my favorite. And we're moving to, uh, we're moving to APM server. By far, APM is my favorite application in the observability stack for Elastic because it's, it's mile leaps and uh, uh, bounds above, above the rest. The only issue was APM server, you cannot run it as part of the Elastic agent. I mean, you can if it's part of the fleet, but not when, it, when it's standalone. I don't know why. I, I, at this point, I'm not sure I want to know why, uh, but it's the case. So we ran our, our own APM server. We dug up, like after learning from our mistake with deploying Elastic Agent, we didn't download the YAML. We used the, the, the Helm chart that was three years old, but fortunately it still worked even with the newer version. So, so that went fine. We couldn't use the Elastic, uh, the APM server that was that was provided by uh, as part of the, our cloud deployment, because we needed to do other things. For example, make sure that the data from production are uh, uh, kept around for longer than the data from QA or or development environments. And that kind of concludes the second part of the presentation. Now it gets fun. 
now you finally understand why this, why I talk this, uh, why I call this talk, you know, the therapy that that I that I deeply needed after this after this year. And that is what are all the kind of the weirdest parts that, that we have uh, that we have met. So I, I just mentioned that for APM server and obviously for other data sources as well, we needed to set different retention for, for different environments. Luckily, uh, Elasticsearch has, has an elastic stack has tools for that. So you can define a namespace for each, for each Elastic agent and it goes to a different namespace. You have ILM to control the policy and you have index templates uh, to kind of associate the two, the data stream that comes in with the template. So I was like, cool. So I have my three different namespaces. So I'll go to the documentation to, on how to set it up. So I was presented with this, a guide how to do this in the UI. The only problem is you can probably read it for significant deployment. If you're using pretty standard, pretty standard stuff, again, just GCP and Kubernetes, we ended up with roughly 400 data streams. I am not paid. I've never, ever been paid in my life enough to do this 400 times to click in some UI uh, in four different screens to accomplish something that should be kind of built in. Because funnily enough, this documentation page starts with, oh, one of the reasons why you might want to do this is if you want to set different retention for your different environments. So it was specifically what I wanted, but not what I wanted at all. So this is one part of kind of the surprises that you got along the way. And notice at this point, it's, it would be fair to also point out the other, the other thing. I am not necessarily hating on, on all of these things. All of these things in, in their individuality are easy to overcome. Uh, Elasticsearch has an API for templates, for ILM, for all of these things. I can and I did write a script to solve this. The same with deploying Elastic Agent into, into a Kubernetes cluster. It's not that hard. Like it's, it's a service like any other. Uh, it is well documented and th th there are the, the uh, examples in terms of the 2000 uh, line YAML file on all that it needs, including you know, the, um, the service account it needs and the level of permissions. It's just that every single step of the way, we hit a snag like this. And that doesn't make for a super nice, super nice environment because it doesn't end there. We had, we had another problem and it was our APM server was losing some data. Okay, and that's interesting. We see the data going into the APM server, but we don't see anything on the Elasticsearch side. After some, after some contemplation and some help from Elastic support, we were pointed to there is a, there is a new thing that is uh, kind of trying to protect Elasticsearch from indexing pressure. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing sometimes uh, because the alternative would be that we overwhelm our Elasticsearch uh, cluster and it would just go down. So that's good. The only issue is if Elasticsearch refuses a request because of high indexing pressure, there's nothing in the logs, there's nothing in the monitoring. I'm gonna let that sink in. Like we have absolutely no idea whether Elastic has dropped any data on the ground. Historically, not great. When I reached out to support, they were like, yeah, yeah that, that, that this can be an issue. There is a monitoring API that will give you the information whether historically there were any requests uh, rejected. You just have to check that regularly and compare it to the previous value. I hear that you can use Watcher to do that. Literally, there was a sentence, I hear you can use Watcher for that. I, I did use Watcher for that, that's, that's this code. That's this code I had, to, I had to write to query Elasticsearch itself through the HTTP in, uh, input and store, store, the, store the last number and then compare it to the number before just to make sure that you know, no data has been dropped on the ground. I, you wouldn't want to be like anywhere miles around my office while I was writing this code. The language was not very savory. So that's my second story. And now it comes to the favorite. I, I already tracked down the Kibana team yesterday, the, the day before yesterday, and we had some talk over beer. Um, I show them, show them what I'm about to show you. So there's Kibana alerts. 
uh, if you want to have any kind of alerting in your uh, in uh, in your stack, if you want to be alerted when the CP of the database is too high or too low, super useful alert to have. And again, through uh, through Terraform, we are able to do that. We are able to say every time somebody provisions a database, uh, they're going to be automatically notified if their database utilization is too high, so they might want to bump it up, or too low, which means they have they've overshot. Uh, the utilization and they're wasting money. So the end result was great. It, uh, it allowed us to save a lot of money on databases and to make sure that everything, everything runs smoothly. The entire organization went from customers are calling us that something is wrong to us being automatically alerted two days before it goes wrong. You cannot argue with the results, except if you're the, the guy who had to implement that because there are several different types of, of Kibana alerts. And they all take two parameters. Uh, sort of, what, what is the period that you want to watch? You give it the units and the number of the units. So first, you have, if you wanted to use the Elasticsearch query type alert, there you specify time window size and time window unit. Then, if you want to do a heartbeat alert, Note, this is part of the same API. You specify time range unit and time range count. And finally, if you use metric threshold, you specify time unit and time size. Just to you know, reinforce this, the point, this is the same API. This is the, this is the same code base. This is roughly the same team. And there are other examples. There is, if you, do, if you want to do SLO uh, alert, that's, that's a little different as well. And it goes on. So thank you for listening to my therapy. I had to, I had to get this out. But also, let's, let's, let's be real for a little bit. I am obviously scarred for life. But it is still, it is still perfectly doable. And I hope that you kind of heard me say that several, several times, that we actually managed to accomplish all the things that we set out to accomplish. It, it, it got the job done. This talk is more about, you know, the potential is there. And the only thing that's kind of holding all of this back, is, you know, all the little things. And I literally mean all. It's not just some, it's all of them. Uh, so uh, for, for those of you at Elastic, I hope that you are not super happy about this talk. For all of the other people, I hope that you know that you know all of these promises that you can see in the marketing materials. There are achievable. You can do that. It yeah. You, at, at that point, you might get a little gray hair. It happens to the best of us, but you can get there. And and it is usually worth uh, worth the effort. Just you know, settle down. Make sure that you have a good subscription to you know beer or coffee or whatever whatever's your drink of choice and and you can you can get through it and and that's it i promise a shorter talk lighter on details than canel which was not, not hard <laughs> so if you have any questions i i'm i'm here and i'll be around later thank you so much thank you for watching this video you can watch this next you can leave your comments down below and let us know what you think and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos to come